we don't really do much of an introduction all then i will just say i'm gonna welcome my friend pete holmes to the show hey pete that's it <laughs> that's it <laughs> okay great i am welcomed i feel welcome it's so nice to see you i miss you man i really do a lot of work goes into a short late night stand-up set Join me, J.P. Buck, as I spotlight the comedians who came up with some of my favorite coin sets. This is The Setup. Please welcome the very funny Pete Holmes. I had been submitting sets. I really wanted to be on Conan by the time I was 30. It was, only, it was one of the very few um, specific, like, actual goals. I had certain goals, but they were all sort of like rainbows. They were vague and... I don't know, some magical feeling in the future. <laughs> but I was like, I want to do Conan by the time I'm 30. And I, I based that on almost nothing. And um, I was 31. I used to joke that I blamed my divorce because that's sort of like eight a year <laughs> of my life. It sort of slowed me down. Uh -huh, but I was yeah. right, I was right on, on time. When I was trying to get on Letterman, you'd send them a five minute tape. And then they'd be like, we like it, except maybe this joke. Then you'd send them another, it would take another month to get mm -hmm. a five minute tape that you liked with that joke removed and this one in. Where I'm like, if you just sent a longer tape, you could be like, yeah, okay, you want yeah. a, a different 30 seconds, here you go. But that's not even what got it for me, is then you happened to be at the improv on Melrose, and I was doing, I was going on last, and I was so happy that you were there, because this is what everybody thinks show business is, like the Booker for Conan will be in the crowd, <laughs> and you were there, and we had been exchanging tapes and stuff, and you watched me, and I did the Google bit, and then, this is such good timing. It's like you liked the Google bit and you wanted to premiere it on Conan, which was like the best news ever. And I had already taped it for the John Oliver show, which is what Conan plugs in the mm -hmm. intro. So <laughs> yeah. I'm like, isn't it funny? We're plugging the show that features the bit that's breaking on this show to beat that show. I was like, anytime if you're pitching a TV show or a set or any idea, if there's anything that can put a clock on it, that can be like, we need to do this before this. It's always mm -hmm. helpful. And, and, and I feel like that greased the wheels. It actually kind of works that I'm wearing this terrible shirt. It's like a smock <laughs> for painting. It's just like, like nobody tells you what to wear. Like I just kind of came in that shirt and um, it's, it's too big. And, but it, that, that helped because when I say um, I'm not a cool guy, I don't know if you can tell by my overall vibe. That's the first joke. Yeah, I don't think they would have laughed if I hadn't done something sort of fumbly bumbly up top. And that actually included how I looked. Like if I was wearing a suit or something and I said, I don't know if you can tell I'm not a cool guy. If I looked like Mulaney or something, you'd be like, no, you, you seem like a pretty cool guy. Like I, you're sharp and well-dressed. So even the, the, the outfit was sort of telling the first joke. I think it was, um, Seinfeld or maybe Chris Rock that talked about you always um, wave, wave to the host and wave to the band. And they were like, that's the quickest way to look like a professional. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that was exciting. Uh, how's it going, everybody? It came out and I just wanted them to laugh at me smiling, standing there. And when they didn't, I'm sort of like, how are you? Like I'm trying to establish up top which of course you do live, but it's even more important, I think, for TV sets. It's like, I'm, you're watching me, but I'm watching you. I, I don't wanna feel like I'm showering on stage and you're watching me. I wanna be like, I say this to crowds. I go, you're, you're evaluating me, I'm evaluating you. Like, I'm gonna talk to other people about how you were. <laughs> like, yeah. it, this is not, and, that, and that's to get them sort of in a performative place. I wanna get this out of the way right up top. I'm not a uh, cool person. I don't know if you can uh, tell already from my overall vibe. <laughs> I don't know if this is gonna make sense, but I'm 31 years old, I don't have any kids, but I'm already kind of like a fun dad. <laughs> can you get that sense from me? Just like the dorky dad at a barbecue, just like oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Fresca, that guy. <laughs> Singing hip hop wrong to children, just like, I'll say you can have whatever you need, yeah. <laughs> Snacks on dad. Patron, no Patron. <laughs> Fun dad. Like I don't have kids, but if I did, I'd be the kind of dad they're having a sleepover. I'd keep barging in, embarrassing them with a tray of food. Just like, tuna melts, dad style. <laughs> That's extra mayo. <laughs> if you like it, then you should put some cheese on it. If you... Get out of here, dad. 
you like it, then you shouldn't put your feet on it. <laughs> Seriously, Kyle, the ottoman is decorative, so. You didn't know, you didn't know. This bit, at this point, I believe in your career, was longer. I remember there's a uh, non-smoking queen joke. Yeah, no, it was longer. The non-smoking queen thing was when John Mulaney, he and I were touring together and I was checking into a hotel and this is just real. They said, uh, one of our rooms is a non-smoking queen. And I went, that's me. <laughs> and um, that's when John said, you're like a fun dad. And I said, and this is what any comedian should say when another comedian makes fun of them, can I have that? <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't, um, we recreated it on Crashing. We had um, Jamie's character mm -hmm. say to me, you're like a fun dad. Because I wanted to show that that's where often jokes come from, is instead mm -hmm. of having your feelings hurt when another comedian, it's like if another comedian makes fun of you, get out your notepad. Like this is how the world sees you. This is probably how the audience doesn't know maybe they see you, but when you say it, you go like, oh right, that, that's a great line. So I have an eye telephone. I have an eye telephone. <laughs> Thank you. Real quick. You that was here. a hot line. That was a hot line at the I time. I love eye telephone. It's a silly little laugh at the top. But here, this moment where you grab the mic, you actually requested a certain mic. I said, like, you have a handheld, you have a wireless, little lav mic, that, that way your hands are free. But you had said to me, I want a wireless mic on a mic stand because I need to, like, lean into this. Yeah. You said this, the physical, physicality of you stepping forward on this bit was very important. It's like grabbing a lever or something. Like it's this thing and I haven't touched it the whole set. No. For the most part. And it almost looks like a, a dance partner. Like you're taking it, like you're gonna dip it. And then it gives you this like, it also feels like a weapon now. It's like, I, I ha I'm armed. I have this, this like spear and this like heavy based mace that I'm gonna like, and the, and the energy, my energy completely shifts and knowing that I could grab the sort of Merlin staff and go like, all right, motherfuckers, you listen to me. Mm -hmm. um, because you sat through that silliness and you stayed with me, I love you now. And, and I, my hope is to give you something that we can all enjoy, but like, I'm not around anymore, you know? I have Google on my phone. I'm guessing a lot of you do. I have Google on my phone now. And it's ruining our lives. I don't know if you've noticed, it's ruining life because we know everything but we're not a lick smarter for it. We just know. You don't know something, wait two seconds. You will know. Having Google on your phone is like having a drunk know-it-all in your pocket. There's no time for mystery or wonder. You're just like, how do they make glass? And you know. But the time between not knowing and knowing is so brief that knowing feels exactly like not knowing. <laughs> so life is meaningless. The craziest thing about this joke is that it was a fresh take. Like when I say I have Google on my phone, that was kind of a newer thing. That meant like I have a fancy phone and yeah. only probably 33% of the crowd probably had a smartphone at that time. So it was like breaking news. Like I, I have, especially when I first started telling the joke. I've literally been in bed in the morning alone, just like, where's Tom Petty from? <sighs> but I feel nothing, because there was no time to not know. Listen to me, there was a time, and I don't mean to get all Andy Rooney on ya, but there was a time that if you didn't know where Tom Petty was from, you just didn't know. And you felt that yearning and that deficit in your being, and you'd go around and ask actual people. Like, where's Tom Petty from? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And now I'm impregnated with wonder, and then they go and ask people, until one fateful day, you see a girl wearing a Heartbreakers t-shirt, you rush up to her and you're like, hey, where's Tom Petty from? And she tells you, Florida, and a wave of endorphins and pleasure and meaning would wash over you and you felt something and that's how you met your wife. Do you understand? 
Your wedding song was Refugee. This was the first sort of joke that I was like, I will not forget how I feel about uh, smartphones and Google because I care. And, you, and that's where the grabbing the mic and that's when I'm yelling, but it's earned. And, and the pace picks up. I'm watching one man struggle with his search for Tom Petty, which is so inconsequential because what are you going to do with this information? But then at the end, <laughs> the payoff is, look what, that was, look what you've that achieved. That was a click moment for me was to try and tie it back to something human. Like, mm -hmm. it's not just that you want to know, it's that the conversation leads to meeting someone because not knowing leads you to going up to a woman in a shirt. So that, that was like, that's when I realized it was a bit. You know, you had a rant and then you were like, oh, there's a moment where they'll, they'll clap because they'll know that it's over because you brought the beginning to the end. Life is meaningless and before it used to be like this. Um, so it's super, super exciting. Blank and Empty says, this would be funnier if he wasn't wearing that shirt. <laughs> it is funnier because I'm wearing a terrible shirt, but mm -hmm. we can agree that it's a terrible shirt. Is, yes, I think everyone that lands on the side of it's a terrible shirt. It's now my bedspread. I, I, it's very soft. This is from Radical Moose Lim. I like the guy. He makes great skits on Comedy Central and he's a good actor. A good public speaker with a lot of important things to say, but he's not that funny for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, there's my favorite story. <laughs> I don't know who the comedian was, but it was at Stand Up New York. I think Mulaney told it to me. I don't know if he saw it firsthand, but he was killing. And there was one guy in the front that wasn't laughing. And the guy in the middle of his set leaned down to the guy that wasn't laughing. And he said, I agree with you, but we're outnumbered. That's sort of how I feel when somebody's <laughs> like, that wasn't that funny. I'm like, I agree with you, but we're outnumbered. <laughs> Thankfully, we're outnumbered. I think yeah. more people like that. Gable says, always thought this guy was a bozo, but he's actually quite funny here. And I've been an asshole. Hashtag, I'm sorry, Pete Holmes. Oh my God, let's get that trending. <laughs> I, that to me is, is extra special. There's nothing better than somebody, I've had that too, where you're just like, maybe you look like somebody, uh, you look like my ex-boyfriend or, or, or you look like this guy that bullied me. There's all of this projection going on that we, we prejudge people and we don't give them a chance. And I do it every single day too. But when someone can win them over, and find some common ground. That's what laughing is, you know? It's so special to get everybody laughing together. But if there's somebody that came in that was like, Fuck this guy, and then at the end they're like, that was okay. That's sort of like one of the rarest jewels in the stand-up cave, and, and that's extra special. I never thought that this set would lead to all the things that we've done together, and that doesn't include our, you know, our dates to you know, industry events where you've been I my know. plus one. JP always brought me as his plus <laughs> one. Okay, here's all the ways you have to include this, that JP helped my career. He gave me my first uh, late night TV show, which was with Conan. Then when they made a list of people that could possibly have a show with Conan, he submitted my name. Then produced on my show, The Pete Holmes Show. And then while that was happening, I would go to the HBO Emmy party with JP as his plus one, because I was not invited. And it was at that party that I first talked with Jet. Judd Apatow, who ended up producing, and Judd was a fan of the Pete Holmes show. So I, I don't know if I'll ever be able to do it, but if I win an award, it's always my fantasy <laughs> to get up, thank the people that were involved in that project, and then say, I'd also like to thank J.P. Buck, Jeff Ross, Conan O'Brien, you know what I mean? Like David Kissinger, uh, all the people that worked on that show. I, I think the optics might be bad, but that is my fantasy to be like, it's not this show, it's all the things that lead up to that show. And that's when you really need it. You really need someone that goes, I like this guy. When you're just a comedian, you know, sweating it out at the improv lab on Melrose and JP says, let's give this guy a shot. That means the world. So any chance I get, you have to leave that in. Any oh, chance I get, I, I have to thank you, JP. I appreciate that at the same time, like, it was a pretty easy decision to make to bring you on the show. <laughs> so very nice of you. Um, and I'm just also very happy that it's led to a, you know to a great friendship too. And so it's this was as close as we can get to hang out backstage. So I'm glad yeah. that we got to do this.